And tonight I'm just obviously um, being the headmaster of the school. Uh, my mind is always focused upon our, our kids, upon our youth. And so um, I'm going to start in Psalms 127, verse 3, where it says, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. How true that is. Children, grandchildren, they're a gift of God. And uh, such an amazing gift that, that um, should I move that? that they bear great responsibility. And the responsibility is not just for us. The responsibility is on the children as well. Um, in fact, it says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 20, children, obey the state in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Oh, wait a minute. That's not what it says. It says, children, obey your parents in everything. For this pleases the Lord. It's not the state. Your parents. Hmm. God commands children to obey their parents. But the governor of New Mexico has signed into a law an act that makes the employees of the state assist children in disobeying their parents. Uh, in the, when it comes to killing babies, sterilizing, and mutilating children. Um, so let me be clear. Uh, tonight I'm going to shoot very straight very unapologetically um, because this is extremely important. Um, it, this is not an evangelical message. In fact, what I'm doing is I'm going back to a practice that's, that was really in vogue during the 1700s. It's what really raised us up as a nation. It was the result of the Great Awakening. And what you would have is a pastor would use uh, Sunday and he would use small Bible studies for the purposes of expositing the text uh, and, and doing a hermeneutic upon, uh, upon the scripture. But they would gather together the people, the citizenry, in the midweek. In the middle of the week, they would call together the people and the pastors would take on the issues of the day and they would um, relate them to what the scripture says about the things that were affecting their life from week to week to week to week. It was called the midweek lecture. And that's what I'm going to do tonight. It's, it, it's not so much an evangelical message except to look at what's going on in our lives right now and to find out what does the Bible command us to do in these situations. And, uh, but I also want to be careful um, being that I shoot straight and I will be unequivocal in my language, I don't want you to think that I'm up here venting or ranting and that this is a matter of opinion. Um, because my name's on this, Sean Gibson, and it's April 26, 2023. This is going to be recorded. It's going to be out there. And, uh, and I would encourage anyone um, to, to listen. And if they disagree, tell me why I'm wrong. I, I'm not going to be venting opinion. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be careful in what I speak. So obviously, I'm in reference to um, House Bill 7, which I have right up here, which was signed, in, uh, signed into law. The short title of it is Reproductive and Gender Affirming Health Care Freedom Act. That is a mouthful of euphemisms, isn't it? Reproductive and Gender Affirming Health Care Freedom Act. Sounds nice. Um, I'm going to propose that it's not an accurate title, that the accurate title of this act is the Abortion and Child Sterilization and Mutilization Tyranny Act. And I'm going to make my case. For those of you who are not aware of the act, essentially what it does is it identifies what it calls a public body, which means state or local government employees, those who are paid and receive public funding and have been set up under the Constitution of New Mexico. Um, and that includes school districts and institutions of higher education. So this includes, and honestly I believe is targeted, at public school employees and university uh, professors. And what it does is it actually kind of holds a gun to their head and it says that they will not interfere, which means they will not notify parents, um, when it comes to... Um, as they put it, reproductive and gender-affirming health care. And so I want to kind of look into that a bit and what it says specifically. First of all, it says that they will not interfere with reproductive health care, another euphemism. 
Um, because what it says, it defines it as this. It means any psychological, behavioral, surgical, pharmaceutical, and medical care services and supplies that relate to human reproduction, that relate to preventing a pregnancy, contraception, abortion, prenatal, birth, perinatal, and postpartum health. Now, there's another list of, uh, of additional services, but this act really has nothing to do with them. Nobody would try to uh, um, hinder any of the other services like preventing cancer and stuff like that. Nobody's going to try to stop that. It's really our, uh, it's, it's about these situations right here. And of course, the first one there being abortion. And of course, it doesn't call it abortion. It calls it reproductive health care. But abortion has nothing to do with reproduction. And it's not, definitely not health care because at least one individual gets killed and the other one gets harmed. And so I wouldn't call that health care. In fact, I think what we're doing here is they're saying you will not um, interfere or notify parents about this, which means if a, if a child comes up and says, uh, I'm pregnant, I need an abortion, uh, it is now by law prohibited for any teacher to inform the parent. It's not that they're not encouraged. They, they can't. They, they, that is a prohibited action under this law. And, uh, and, and there are fines and penalties and enforcement that is eg executed against the person who conducts this, the entity that conducts this. And so, but they didn't justify abortion. You see, you notice how that never gets, we, we, don't, we don't put first things first. And we need to find out what justifies abortion. If we're going to talk about abortion at all, we have to come to a conclusion. What would justify abortion? Now, I'm not going to use their term, reproductive health care, because I believe that that's, uh, th th that's equivocating killing with health care. And so I have a different way that I refer to it. And my question would be, what justifies killing an innocent human child? Now, some people would oppose that, but the, I use four words, killing an innocent human child. But all you have to do is refute the words that saying that I'm using them gratuitously or using them fallaciously. The first word, killing. All you have to do is to prove that I'm wrong in using that word killing. You have to just show me that the fetus is not alive before the procedure and dead after the procedure and that the procedure was premeditated. But if abortion is the premeditated ceasing of, of, of a fetus's life, then that is killing. Innocent. All you have to show is that the fetus is guilty of something. Is the fetus guilty of rape? Is it guilty of a crime? No, then innocence, fine. Human, all you have to show is show me that the fetus is feline or canine or bovine or something else. But if not, it's human. And a child, all you have to do to refute that is to show me that the fetus is not genetically unique from both mother and father, in fact, every other person on the planet, and is in the process of maturing unto adulthood. But the truth is, is these are all very scientifically, rationally, logically truisms. What justifies killing an innocent human child? Now, I have proposed this question to um, activists, abortion activists, and to medical doctors, and to people with PhDs, and nobody's ever answers this question because they can't answer the question because they're in a, they're in a very bad place. Uh, and what they may say is, well, you, the, the fetus is not viable. Of course it's viable as long as you don't kill it. I'm viable as long as you don't kill me or give me a vaccine or something. <laughs> and they say, well, but the baby is dependent upon the mother. It's like we're all social creatures. We're all dependent. Let's, let's strip any of us naked, drop us in the wilderness. We're not going to last too long. We're dependent upon each other. We're dependent upon societies for survival. So these are mute arguments. So the idea here is, is that what just, they're, they're not going to say that, but what they're saying, you're going to, you're, so now let's rephrase it accurately. That a public body is not to interfere or notify a parent when somebody wants to kill an innocent human child. And I don't think anybody would agree with that. It also, um, if you've heard that this also is an infanticide bill, let me explain that. It says um, that any services related to prenatal, birth, perinatal, and postpartum health. Um, the concern here comes up with the word perinatal. Perinatal, by definition, means up to 28 days after birth. And so perinatal is the term that has been used in the California bills and laws 
um, that have promoted and, and have made legal infanticide. They could have easily just said prenatal birth and postpartum health. But when you include perinatal, you're incorporating legal terms that said that these services can be provided up to 28 days after birth. And so it's causing many people to be very skittish in saying that this is opening the door for infanticide. Uh, So this is really a horrible piece of legislation. Now let's get back to the scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 27 said, verse 25 says, Cursed be anyone who takes money to shed innocent blood and all the people shall say, Amen. Amen. Uh, That is Deuteronomy 27, 25. Cursed be anyone who takes money to shed innocent blood and all the people shall say amen. Obviously, we would immediately identify that those abortion providers are taking money to shed innocent blood. Unfortunately, this act now lumps in all public bodies because what it says is it defines them as those who receive public funding and they can't interfere. So in other words, what they're saying is, hey, you took the check, be quiet. Don't get in the way of killing innocent human children. That's a very horrible thing to do to our brothers and sisters who work in public schools. Horrible, horrible act. And so the second part is you also won't interfere with gender affirming health care, which is defined as psychological, behavioral, surgical, pharmaceutical, and medical care services and supplies provided to support a person's gender identity. And this concept of gender identity is a mutual, it's, it's basically a destruction of our English language. And the idea here is that there is a difference between sex and gender. That sex would be your biological sex, male, female. But that gender is something that's different from that that occurs in the mind. The problem is, is that it's based on the word gender, which comes from the root gene, which means genetic or birth type. And it's always in reference to sex, right? But what it's saying is, is, so it's it's a misuse of the term. Um, But it's already been, it's been absconded with and it's been stolen. And so this is the idea out there, that there is a difference between sex and gender. So we'll use their horribly adulterated definition of the term. And what they're saying is that we need to affirm, support, um, promote a person's misbelief, their delusion, their um, dysphoria, because it holds more validity than their biological reality. That a person's opinion, their misbelief, overrides reality. And that we're supposed to then support that. Well, I think that when stated plainly and clearly like that, we'd go, that makes absolutely no sense. Somebody's opinion doesn't override reality. Especially if it's delusional. If it's dysphoric. If it's, if it's not accurate. We would not hold this same definition for somebody who is anorexic or bulimic. We wouldn't hold this for somebody who's schizophrenic. We wouldn't say, well, but th- that's what they believe in their mind. Therefore, we must support it. We must support this uh, uh, bulimia. We wouldn't do that. We'd go, no, we must help this individual. And I think that's the problem here is that the people who are, uh, uh, can I be completely honest here? The trans, people who are suffering with transgenderism or, or, or gender dysphoria is the more accurate term, let's face it, gender dysphoria. They're, they are very fragile people. And they're being used as puppets to advance a political agenda. That is a horrible thing to do to a group of people who are who are compromised. And so the idea here is why would we do that? Why would we why would we do that? Well, we have to do that, or they might they might kill themselves. So let me explain to you on this gender affirming healthcare, psychological and behavioral. What what kind of psychological and behavioral services do you think what are they talking about well I can tell you what they're talking about they've already taken great roads on that uh, and that they passed the New Mexico social studies standards Um, they promulgated these recently you see New Mexico is uh, 50th out of 50 uh, in education and the United States as a whole is absolutely tanking when it comes to the study of social studies Social studies is a curriculum focus that focuses on classes in history, government, economics, geography, and anthropology. So you would assume that social studies standards would be relative to those those sciences, right? 
Um, what they did is they promulgated a set of standards, 105 pages long, to replace the previous 26 pages. But what's interesting is what's noticeably lacking from these standards. Um, terms that never show up in the standards, like for, say, American history, Washington, Jefferson, Adams, Madison, Revere, Lincoln, Eisenhower, Martin Luther King, they show up zero times. Zero times. These individuals evidently don't rate the standards. Uh, in fact, in government, president, senate shows up zero times. Um, judicial shows up. Uh, standard 8.89 says, discuss the impact of significant legislation and judicial precedents in formally perpetuating systemic oppression. That's something we need to teach our kids, isn't it? Um, we're going to teach geography, but with no discussion of borders. Borders doesn't show up at all. Um, again, with government, patriotism, not in there. Providence, not in there. Declaration of Independence, not in there. Declaration of Human Rights, yeah, that's in there. But not the Declaration of Independence. Not the Magna Carta, not the Northwest or Ordinance. How do you, and, and not Bible, not, obviously not Bible. How do you discuss Western civilization or the history of the United States of America without mentioning the scriptures? You see, these things aren't in there. Well, if this stuff's not in there, oh, here's the other thing. Um, the Constitution does show up. But half the time, it's in reference to how to redesign the Constitution. Um, the Heritage Foundation wrote a piece on the New Mexico Social Studies Standards, completely mocking it and exposing it, and that it has nothing to do with improving uh, social studies performance in the students in New Mexico. It has everything to do with raising up a radicalized group of youth to advance a political agenda. It's an absolute um, travesty being hoisted upon our children and our grandchildren. So what does show up in the standards? Well, identity shows up 156 times. Group, 104 times. Group identity, 32 times. Identities, 24 times. Diversity, 32 times. Diverse, 31 times. Equity, 29 times. Not equality, equity. Equity is the idea of having an equal opportunity, right, or having equal justice under the law. Equity is having, forcing an equal outcome regardless of merit or justice but completely based upon identity. Um, systemic oppression shows up 10 times. Systemic inequity shows up um, 10 times, but these are terms are never defined. Um, anyway, it's ridiculous. This is what's being pushed, and it's being pushed to try to get children to discuss and to think about, by the way, this starts in, pre, in kindergarten up. These standards start in kindergarten and how to to advance these ideas into children. And a lot of, oh, LGBTQIA plus shows up in there. Uh, sexual orientation shows up three times. Declaration of Independence, not at all, but sexual orientation shows up multiple times. So you can see that there's an agenda associated with this. This is part of that uh, psychological and behavioral uh, conditioning towards supporting gender identity issues. But what about the chemical ones? Well, the chemical ones uh, start with something called puberty blockers. Puberty blockers were developed uh, to stop what is called gonadotropic release hormone. Gonadotropic release hormone, uh, when it comes out of the pituitary, it starts the idea of, of, of puberty, starts puberty. And, but there's something called precocious puberty. And that's when a, a child, maybe say six, seven, eight years old, starts to go through puberty way too early, has a lot of serious high, uh, side effects. So they came up with drugs that would stop and would suppress uh, that gonadotropic release hormone. And so the idea is what you would do is that you, th these drugs were approved by the FDA for the purposes of stopping an abnormal adolescence and stalling it until the child reached the proper age for adolescence and then allowing normal adolescence to go forward. Well, now these drugs are being abused and they're used to stop normal adolescence so that they can initiate an abnormal puberty. Because you see, what you follow up the uh, puberty blocking hormone with is cross sex hormones. And so what you do is you have a young man and you, put, you, you stop him from going into normal puberty and then you pump his body full of estrogen so that you can force an unnormal puberty towards the development of uh, feminine traits. For a young woman, you stop her normal puberty and then you pump her body full of testosterone to force an abnormal puberty. Obviously, 
once we started this process, we've sterilized the child. The child's sterilized. And, and what's, what you're going to find that happens is that it, it also more and more and more detrimental health effects come after this. Then it says that it, you won't get in the way of surgical support for this. Well, the surgical support would then be uh, mastectomies for the girl or um, basically breast augmentation for a boy. And then finally, m messing with the, s the sexual reproductive organs and trying to convert a penis into a vagina or a vagina into a penis and mutilating the child. All right, this is the, the sequence that they're saying, don't get in the way of that. Don't tell the parents about this. And by the way, to support House Bill 7, Senate Bill 327, I believe it is, uh, Senate Bill 397, Senate Bill 397 uh, is an act that was also signed that will put school-based health centers uh, into the schools so that they can receive these services in the school and they're approved for providing uh, condoms and um, prophylactics and uh, abortifactants and puberty blockers and so forth. There are, those, those have already been identified in the services that can be provided in these school-based health clinics. Uh, this is for real. Is that crazy? And if you were to say like, how do they ever justify this? Their whole thing is we have to give them this care. We have to do this, otherwise these children are going to kill themselves, which is an absolute lie. The studies don't support that at all. I went and it, it took no time at all. You get the base research, not just not the, not the, not the radical fringe research, you get the, 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 the solid research. Um, this study right here, mm -hmm, this study, long-term follow-up uh, of transsexual persons undergoing sex reassignment surgery, a cohort study in Sweden. Sweden, uh, Sweden, uh, the Swedish people are weirdos. They've been doing um, sex, exchange, sex change surgeries. You can't do sex change. Sorry. Sex change is a misnomer. You can't change somebody's sex. That never will happen. You can go through everything that I just talked about, and that little girl will not have a Y chromosome anywhere in her body. All right? You can go through all of those processes, and the young man um, will have a Y chromosome in every cell of his body. You're, you can't change the sex. That's impossible. You're just mutilating and sterilizing um, but Sweden has been doing these kind of procedures uh, for a very long time. And so they have, this is the largest study uh, over 300 and um, how, many, how many cases? 324 reassignment surgeries. That's a lot of reassignment surgeries. And that, they were done way in the past. So this is a 30-year longitudinal study. And the conclusion of this study, and obviously the people doing this study were about it because they performed that many surgeries right? They're just doing the follow-up to try to find out how successful did this, and this is their conclusion. Persons with transsexualism after sex reassignment have considerably higher risk for mortality, suicidal behavior, and psychiatric morbidity. Did you hear that? They're worse off. They're more apt to commit suicide. They're more apt to die. They've got huge health concerns. You get cardiovascular disease, clotting uh, formations. You get huge, uh, a, a huge increase in diabetes because you're completely messing with their, their endocrine system. And, uh, and so this is the longest study, but, but it is an older study. So you say, well, that's old studies. And I'm like, okay, let's get something new. This was hot off the press last month. This is a review of um, all the long-term studies on transgender populations. And this is the summary. The conclusions of the systematic reviews of the evidence for adolescents are consistent with the long-term adult studies, which means they failed to show credible improvement in, medical, in mental health, and they suggest a pattern of treatment-associated harms. In other words, all of these activities don't help, they hurt. And, and the, the ink's not dry on this study. This is an amazing study. This is a review of pretty much every study that's happened, over 40 studies on here. And, uh, and it's excerpts from all the studies. I'd love just to read it to you. It would make you, um, you'd want to spit, you'd get so mad, right? But let me give you the five conclusions on it. 
The first conclusion, research does not support medical intervention for gender-confused minors. The research says you should have a watchful waiting. In other words, when you have a child who's gender dysphoric, a child who is uncomfortable in their own skin, they're struggling with their sexual identity, which honestly is pretty much every, every teenager, right? You just let it right out. Um, you don't start pumping chemicals into their system. Second, um, second conclusion, medical transition procedures have not been shown to reduce transgender suicide. In fact, there is some evidence that medical transition increases suicide risk in gender-confused teens. By the way, the, the, uh, if, you, if you go and Google this, you're not going, you, you gotta f go deep to find the actual studies because what you're gonna get inundated if you, if you look at um, transgender surgery harm to teenagers or something, all you're gonna get is a bunch of media uh, headlines that say that we have to provide these services or kids will kill themselves. And most all of them uh, will quote the Turban 2020 study. What's interesting about the Turban study is in the Turman study, they said of those who were re able to receive um, uh, gen puberty blockers and, and, and cross-sex hormones, that they had a lower um, ideology of suicide. They thought about suicide less. But then a doctor from Oxford went back and looked at the data and he said, wait a minute, that same group committed suicide twice as much. But they, didn't, they failed to mention that. They said, you gotta do this because they'll think about suicide less but they'll do it more. I mean, it's just completely, it's nuts, right? Anyway, it's in here. Uh, and so it, the claims that we have to provide these services or these kids will kill themselves is an absolute bald face lie. Third conclusion, research shows childhood gender dysphoria dissipates on its own through adulthood. Uh, under these studies, you've got 70%, 80%, 90% of kids get through it. I mean, we already knew that. Don't you remember? I, for those of you who are older than 30 or something, right? When a girl wanted to climb trees and wear boots and everything, you just call her a tomboy. And if a boy wanted to sew his own clothes and, 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 and paint things, you call them artistic. They're just, they're just kids. You just let them be who they are. And they, and they grow out of it most all of the time. Very few hold to this. But here is the alarming part, and this is what nobody's talking about. Check this out. This is new. The evidence is starting to come in. Not the evidence they wanted, but the real evidence. Check this out, the fourth conclusion. The dramatic increase in gender dysphoria, which means this whole transgender idea, in the past decades is influenced by social factors, which means social pressure, cultural pressure, is causing this increase in transgenderism. The most ex exhaustive study on um, human sexuality done in the United States by the CDC, uh, which was just a, a handful of years ago, declared that there was like less than a fraction of a percent of the population was transgendered. In the past decade, in the UK, um, referrals for transgender surgeries for young boys has gone up 1,000%. For young girls, 4,400%. That's insane. And what they're, they're now finding out is that they're calling it a social contagion, which means when you take a population that's fragile, like children going through puberty, and you make these suggestions, they absorb it and they manifest it. That, that this gender dysphoria is not genetic, it's not dietary, it's being hoisted on them and they're receiving it. In other words, it's our fault. We're letting this happen to our kids. It's not some genetic new thing. It's not some disease or virus. It's the cell phones we're putting in their hands. It's the culture that we're being quiet and we're letting talk to our children. This is being hoisted upon them and they're receiving it. And because of it, their suicide rates are going through the moon. And finally, the last uh, um, conclusion from, uh, from this review is that teaching uh, sexuality, gender identity, and sexual orientation to elementary school 
is not shown to be beneficial at all and no studies have been done to look at the harmful effects of doing this. In other words, we're passing laws to do things to our children that we haven't even studied without any just um, that's getting to be the new that's the new habit isn't it let's do something that we haven't researched let's do something radical um, that hasn't gone through the appropriate testing let's get back to the scriptures on this it says Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And I would say that we would not be reaching to say, and who substitute male for female and female for male. And I don't believe that that's twisting the scriptures at all because it says in the Torah, it says that a man who dresses as a woman is abomination unto God and a woman who presents herself as a man. This, this idea of presenting yourself as the opposite sex is an abomination. In Romans chapter one, it says that the woman abandoned the normal function of men for others and men in the same way abandoned the function of the woman for men and burned in their lust. Men inside of men receiving in their own bodies the due penalty of their error which means they'll incur more disease inside their bodies which has happened. That's a whole other message, right? The Bible's true. It's always true. And so this idea that we're going to confuse the order of creation that God has established from Genesis 1 is an abomination and, and, and so, but it's now New Mexico law. And then finally, I used, I used a word called tyranny, and I want to explain that. Remember, I said this is all about the public body or entities. They are not to deny, restrict, or interfere with, which means you will not let parents know. You will not deprive these services based on potential or actual effect on the pregnancy, which means you cannot act in accordance with your own conviction. And finally, it says, um, you will not impose or continue to affect any law, ordinance, policy, or regulation that violates or conflicts with the provisions of this act, which means that no school board, no mayor, no government agency within the state, or no future legislators are able to enact any law or policy or workaround that would get in the way of this act. In other words, they're shutting, this, put it together, shut up. Sit down, I don't care what you believe, and you can't touch what we just said. That's called tyranny. That's, that's, ter that's tyrannical. So what we have here uh, is really um, the abortion and child sterilization, mutilization, tyranny act that has been signed into law in New Mexico. And I think that we need to remember the promises of scripture in Luke chapter 17, it says it would be better for them if a millstone were hung about their throat and they were to be thrown into the sea than that they should cause one of these little ones to stumble. By the way, those are the words of Jesus Christ. He used very descriptive and colorful language to say it would be better for you to have a stone that weighs hundreds or thousands of pounds tied around your throat and for you to be thrown in the sea then you mess with a child. But there's also a verse that we as the church should remember. It says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord, Ephesians chapter six. We are commanded not to provoke our children to anger, not to put them in a situation that's going to destroy them in the future, not to do something that's going to confuse them, not to do something that, that, that's going to put undue stress on them, but we're supposed to raise them in the truth of the scripture. We're supposed to teach them the word of God. We're supposed to lead them in the ways of God. That's a command to us. And so how are we going to uh, defend abdicating this responsibility by sending our children into a system that has declared itself to have the authority to raise our children contrary to our convictions and beliefs. How do we rationalize that? How can we excuse turning our children over to non-believers that they might disciple them and speak over them? Essentially saying, excuse me, um, uh, Mr. Non-believer, Mr. Agnostic, would you please speak over my child? Excuse me, um, Miss Globalist, Secular, Humanistic, Environmental, Leftist, 
would you please disciple my child and explain to them how I'm wrong for believing in God and in his word? You might be going, Pastor Sean, you're, you're kind of going a little, aren't, aren't you going a little far here? Not one iota. Because this is in their platforms, their manifestos, it's in their standards, it's in the curriculum, it's in their policies, it's in their guidelines, and it's in their trainings. And I have examples for every single one of those categories. It is replete, it is saturated within the system that this is what their plan is and this is what they're doing. In fact, uh, we, have a, we have a clip. There was a presentation just a few months ago was a gathering of the NMSBA. The NMSBA is the New Mexico School Board Association and that's where they gather in all of the school board members from all over the state and they pay people to speak to them and this uh, specific lawyer was paid for by the New Mexico School Board Association to speak to the school board members and I believe to say exactly what he said. He was not rebuked for this. He was paid for this and there's a little, we have a little um, excerpt of that. Um, it's hard to hear because it was uh, clandestinely recorded from under the table with somebody's cell phone uh, so that you may have to, to read the uh, subtitles uh, to understand what's being said. But this is what the lawyer, this is what, they're, this is what they're teaching our school board members. Remember, your most powerful governing tool is the power of the pocketbook. School district doesn't do anything unless you're going to fund it, right? These are very fine points of why you're so valuable and so important with regards to public education. Okay, parental rights like are developed by the common law. The idea of the common law was that only parents had the ability to tell, to, to say what was important and what was important for their child, for their child. Religious freedom. What it, basically the argument has been happening now is people are arguing that the religious beliefs trump and allow them to discriminate against others. In other words, now they're saying that the constitutional rights have precedence over each other. So you're gonna see a lot more everything based on that religious freedom type argument. There are reasons why when you send your kid to school, you give it up some of that constitutional right. So they can make decisions with regards to their, to, without limitations on custody, care, and anything. But when you send them to school, and by requiring school attendance, you don't have that fundamental right anymore. In other words, the fundamental right of parents with regards to education is you get to pick the school they go to. You do not have the fundamental right to tell the school district how to teach your child. Your choice is if you don't like it, you can get to a private school that was more aligned with your political or your religious beliefs. So all this boils down to parental rights being, they have the right to pick the system they want their kid to enter. But once they enter it, they cannot tell a public school how to teach their child or what to teach your child. You have your fundamental right, but, it, it, but once you've entered the public school system, the public school system prevails. Again, <coughs> parental rights end when you decide to send your kid to public school. The idea See, is that when you go and decide about curriculum, social studies or otherwise, your superintendent and your administration and stuff those are the people who actually know about educating kids. So the manner in which they do that and the subject matter which is necessary, you guys are the judge of whether or not it is patriotic and, and towards a productive society for that to happen. In terms of your community doing that, what are we gonna do about the community? And the basic idea is that if you take out everything that's objectable and appropriate curriculum to one or another religious group, a political group, there's nothing to teach the kids. <laughs> so the public educators, which you guys fall into that category, must decide and say, this is what we think is in the best interest of my kids. If you don't like it, elect me in. Take me out to the next election. What I'm telling you right now is parents don't have the ability to do that. They do not have the ability to tell you this is wrong. If you can rely on the law and say, you don't have that ability to do it, we decide what is appropriate curriculum. You tell and educate the kids on what you believe is appropriate. Parents do not have a fundamental right to tell you how public school teaches their child. They don't like it, they withdraw the kid and go to a private school that's more in with their beliefs. Okay, or homeschool. 
Educators are probably the best people to decide on education, right? If you engage in a policy in which you're going to actually create parental rights where none should or don't exist, or you're going to create opt-out policies so that people can opt out of certain ideas in the curriculum, there'll be nothing to teach the kids. If you, if you allow an opt-out, then, then you're just giving everybody a waiver. If you tell somebody, look, if you don't want your kid to hear that, then remove your kid from class, but they're going to get an F for the, for the course. Public schools, the right to a public education is a state right. Mm -hmm. It is not a fundamental right under the federal constitution. So when you get your letter, what are you going to get? My child is being indoctrinated to be taught that his or her race is inherently racist and evil, and that all our institutions are racist, including your own, and I don't want my child to be woke. <laughs> well, what's going to happen to these poor children? There's lots of options for these children. Now there's more options available to parents. They can do charter schools, they can do home school. There's internet-based schools, there's e-based schools that they can go to. Uh, that's just a snippet that, that somehow your parental rights end when you go to a public school. You know, the one thing that he fails to state there is that he's being paid for with our money. This is our money. These are our children. And public schools do not override the voice of the parent. Now, we know that. They don't know that. The governor doesn't know that. Evidently, our legislature doesn't know that. And so they're passing laws which make him right. It gives him the, the power to say, shut up or go somewhere else. Um, and I think we need to, I think we need to uh, listen to that. These are the school board members. Now, um, this is, it's, it's replete through the system. What do we do? Um, I think the one thing we do is everybody needs to sign the petition to rescind House Bill 7. We have to have 200,000 signatures. Honestly, we have to have more than 200,000 because they'll try to uh, discredit. Uh, and then let it go to a vote for the people because I, I can't imagine anybody would ever vote for House Bill 7. I, I am glad to say that our representatives uh, here in Valencia County voted against it, but obviously the majority of representatives voted for it, as did the governor. Um, remember, it says, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. We are obligated to obey God and occupy till he comes and train up our children in the way they should go. Train them in the words of God. Sign the petition. And I'm going to say something even maybe, um, well, before I say this, let me preface. I don't want you to hear something I'm not saying. Um, some of you guys in the room, probably in the public schools, you're in the, you're, you work for the public schools, you're a teacher, you're an administrator. Uh, for our brothers and sisters who are in the public system, this law was primarily, they're the target of it. Um, the pastors uh, in this community, we are get, getting together to see how can we defend um, our teachers, how can we defend our administrators. But the truth is, is at this point right now, um, the people who have the power are controlling what's going to happen to our children. It's not saying that teachers that we know and administrators that we know aren't amazing people. It just means that they're, keep, they're, they're being squeezed out. And, I, and, and, and let me say another thing that might be a little bit um, upsetting, but I believe it's accurate. The godly teachers and administrators are the most. Um, teaching colleges and universities have been corrupted for a very long time. And so a good portion of the people who are being kicked out as teachers to, to go into the public schools have already been indoctrinated. And so we cannot rely upon the integrity of the faculty and staff of the public educational system. We know amazing people 
in the public education system. Pray for them, support them, encourage them. I'm, by all means, uh, you, you feel a call there, go. We should send adults into the public education. Adult Christians should go into the public education system. We should be taking over the school boards. We should be taking over the administration. We should be taking over the teachers. We should not be sending our children in there. And so we've got to pray about that. Now, you're going to say, but wait a minute. The reason he was so cocky here is because he knows the truth. You can homeschool. Well, not everybody can homeschool. Not everybody's in a position to, to go home and homeschool. Oh, you can go to private school. Not everybody can, can afford private school for three, four, five kids. They don't have, they don't have the money. Even, even for us, Canon, we've done everything. Our faculty and staff have walked over, away from well over a half a million dollars a year to teach here. Everybody takes huge pay cuts to come and teach here because it's Valencia County. And so we've, we've, we've got it as low as we can to the point where I have to, to negotiate with teachers. Can you make it through this year? Okay, I think I can make it. We pay, uh, usually when you go in and you broker for a job, you try to get paid as much as you can and the company tries to pay you as little as they can to up their profit base, right? That's the way normal business works. It's not the way ministry works. In ministry, the way it works is you come in and you figure out what's the least amount you can get paid. And then my job as a pastor is to try to get you as much money as I possibly can. It's on its head. And we've gotten it as low as we possibly can to the point where we're, you know, we're, we're paying a, just a fraction of, of what's out there. But even that can be difficult for people. But we need to remember something. I want you to listen to this verse in a new context. If anyone does not provide for their relatives, and especially the members of their household, they have denied the faith, and they are worse than an unbeliever. That's 1 Timothy 5.8. If anyone does not provide for their relatives, so we might ask the question, and the members of their household, well, who is my relative? Who are the members of my household? Well, remember when Jesus said, you know, when they said, hey, Jesus, who's our neighbor? He said, your enemy, the Samaritans. He says, anybody who needs you is your neighbor. But you might say, well, but who is my relative? Who are the members of my household? And I'm sure he would say, the kingdom of God. We call each other brothers and sisters. We have one father and one Lord and one spirit. We are a family. And so what we have to do is seriously pray, all of us, all of us. Your kids might be grown and gone, but you got more kids We have to be praying for our kids and our grandkids and our nephews and our nieces and those of our brothers and sisters. And if we deny the members of our own household, we're worse than unbelievers. If we're saying, look, sorry, um, you, you, you need to send them for the transgender indoctrination. What, what are we doing? I I think that's, that's completely unacceptable. Do you, don't you agree? Now, Can I tell you what that means? We all have to change our mindset. I want to, I want to just um, briefly, just really briefly. Um, and, and you might have a very similar experience. I remember when I heard the call of God. When I heard the call of God, I was making a ridiculous amount of money. Uh, I was a consultant, and I, they were just paying me hand over fist. And I got used to that. Uh, you, get, you know how you kind of get used to it, like when, when you get a raise and all of a sudden it's like, hey, where'd it go? <laughs> you just kind of grow into it, right? And so even though I was getting paid a ridiculous amount of money, it just wasn't enough, right? <laughs> and then I heard God say, you're supposed to serve me. And, uh, and when I, I had an opportunity to go into the ministry, it was with a promise of nothing. Um, they said, how much do you need? And I sharpened my pencil. I sharpened my pencil really well. I said, we need 400 a week. And the church said, we don't have it. I said, oh, oh well. He says, well, what are you going to do? I'm like, what do you mean, what am I going to do? You just said you don't have it. He said, yeah, but you said God called you. So I called up Dorothy, my wife. And I said, they don't have it. She goes, oh. I said, so I start Monday. <laughs> and she's like, what? I said, if God calls, we've, we've just, we've got to step off the cliff. 
and uh, and 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 it's exciting, <laughs> and it's and it's a, and it's a life change. And uh, and I was worried my kids didn't starve. My kids didn't starve. In fact, they traveled the world. In fact, the truth is is the experience of my family got in trusting the Lord was so much better than anything I could have provided. You see, when I decided to say no to God, what I was saying is like, no, thank you, God. I will provide for my family, thank you. Which is kind of a foolish thing to say, isn't it? Because I'm not providing nothing. It's the Lord who makes greater, who brings down. And then the Lord said, follow me. And I said, well, can you please show me, can, get, show me the benefit package? Heaven. Heaven's the benefit package. Um, what are the risks? Death, dismemberment, martyr, martyr, martyrship. What, what, what do you need? Crucifixion? Are you going to follow me or not? Right? And so, can I tell you, we all have to do that. Let's face it. Do you not see what's going on? Have the past three years not awakened you? We, we've got to get out of our old mindset. We are here for the kingdom of God. We are here to reach the lost and to raise up our children in the truth. And everything else is irrelevant compared to those things. And we need to start doing this paradigm shift because the truth is we're getting wrecked. Our children are getting wrecked. Our culture has been wrecked. And I think it's because we were distracted. The church was distracted. You can't blame a thief for being a thief. He's a thief. You can't blame evil and wickedness for trying to take over. They're evil and wicked. You can blame the righteous for sitting down and being quiet. And so I think we, we need to be extremely prayerful. Sign the petition. And then you've got to pray. 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 Where are you sending your kids? These laws and these standards start June. They are, they are on in June. And this is not the end of it, I guarantee you. They will not stop. And so we have to be very serious about what we're, we're thinking here. And then finally, it says, see to it that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels see the face of my father. That was Jesus. He says, do not despise one child. Children are a gift of the Lord. Children are a gift of the Lord. They are a gift that we're responsible for. A sacred trust. A holy honor. And, uh, and the truth is... Um, do as I say and not as I do has never been a good strategy. We must live Christianity in front of our children. We must make sacrifices in front of our children to teach them how to make sacrifices. We have to be courageous in front of our children to teach them courage. We have to be generous in front of our, te- our children to teach them generosity. We have to live it in front of our kids. Okay, you can fool me because I see you once in a while passing in the hall. You, you guys are the most holy people ever. Your, your halos are awesome. You're not going to fool your kid. Your kid lives with you all the time. Which means if we're going to be a model for our children, guess what? We need to get radically saved. We need to be, we need to be brutal with our sin. We need to search our hearts. Because we only get to do this once. And so I just want to encourage you in this. I hope that this didn't come across. I tried to be straightforward. I tried to be unequivocal. I tried to be clear. I tried to show you that I'm not just pulling this out of my ear, that this is based upon reality, that these are really, these things are happening. I'm, this, isn't a, this isn't some kind of rhetorical ploy. This is really happening right now. And we must take action. And so I encourage you to pray and act. Jesus said, the one who obeys me is the one who loves me. Not the one who whispers sweet nothings in my ear. The one who obeys me. 
And so um, uh, it was not an evangelical message. But uh, I, will, I will offer this. There might be some of you out there going like, wow, that's, that was different. Um, are you saying that the Bible has things to say about what the governor did last week? The Bible has w- things to say about everything that's important in life. The Bible speaks to eco- economics and government and history and sociology and anthropology and science and language and logic and finances and sexuality and death and family and marriage and everything that you will ever encounter, the Bible has all of the answers. And if you ever just, and you're just like, wow, I've never, I've never tapped into that, then, then come up and, and, and during this time of afterglow, come up and, and let us pray. Get a Bible in your hand and the Holy Spirit in your heart and you will see that God is the most relevant thing ever. And your entire life turns around when you surrender unto God and you follow him.